he, he came into the um, astrophysics of stars class um, that I had, and he had been in other uh, classes with me, 231 in particular, I remember. But um, when he came into astrophysics of stars, this, this class, I, 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 for some reason, it, it connects me to my graduate school days. And so all my students that end up taking that class are inflicted with me at my worst, I think. I think I, um, I, I try to make it this, this boot camp of physics, um, unlike, I think, what my other classes are like. And, and Julian really rose to the occasion. And he came and he talked to me about how he wanted to do spectroscopy. And this is, this is difficult to do. And so when a student comes, maybe I should have been a little more honest with him, but as I said, you want to do spectroscopy, I love it when a student comes and says they want to do spectroscopy at the telescope. And um, there are a lot of challenges there. And, and um, uh, like another former student who did this, um, uh, Julia really did rise to the challenge of this and has some, some nice things to show us. So let's all uh, welcome Julia. Thank you for the excellent introduction, Dr. Jameson. It's very true. You hustled me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I had a lot of fun doing it. It was, it was really awesome. Um, so I did my research on um, Io, mostly, uh, which is a satellite of Jupiter, uh, but also on some other bodies, too, which I'll go over um, in our kind of local area. Um, so my objectives were to become proficient at calibrating and understanding how to use the necessary equipment. So. Um, Spectrograph and telescope are the two big ones. Um, and then be able to reduce um, the spectra, extract data, um, create wavelength calibrated spectra, um, so denoting them by essentially their color. Um, and then also to identify features, so spectral lines, what they correspond to as far as um, composition. Um, so why study IO? Um, Basically, Io is considered, um, it's, a, it's a quote that I grabbed, um, it's the most dynamic body in the solar system. Um, so as a satellite of Jupiter, one of the four Galilean moons, it's the innermost one, so it experiences the most um, gravitational force, um, meaning as it orbits, there's a lot of it's sort of oscillations creating friction, and thus um, heats up the interior and creates volcanoes. Um, so I think it's the most volcanically active um, body in the solar system, not the only, obviously the Earth has volcanoes too and other uh, planets do as well. Um, but it also has a lot of interaction with uh, Jupiter's magnetic field, so a lot of the uh, materials that are emitted from the eruptions are spewed into the surrounding area and kind of tracked up into uh, Jupiter's magnetosphere, um, so a lot of them are ionized gases. Um, and then, so there's also a lot of unknowns regarding Io and what it's made out of, and kind of the activities that take place, so it's an awesome um, kind of test subject to be doing um, spectroscopy on. Um, so what is spectroscopy? I'm just going to briefly go over it. Um, it's basically breaking up light into its component wavelengths, which happens through a phenomenon called diffraction. You can see diffraction in your Pink Floyd shirts. Um, <laughs> and in rainbows, there's a lot of other things going on there too, like refraction, um, but diffraction is kind of the main thing here. Um, and by analyzing kind of the spread of light that you get from an object that you break up its light, um, you can infer different things um, such as composition. Um, if it's moving really fast, you can detect Doppler shifts and know <coughs> its velocity, um, and even temperatures, so um, based on something I'll explain later. Uh, but all that, just from looking at light, if you want to break it down, which is pretty amazing. <coughs> so um, this is just an overview of the machine itself, the spectrograph. It's about that big. It's not too crazy, um, all the little components labeled there, but um, the most important parts are the CCDs, um, charge-coupled devices. Um, so basically there's two of them. Um, one is the tracking CCD, um, which is how you position your celestial object um, in the right spot so as to extract the spectrum. So there's a tiny little, I believe it's 18 microns wide, that's, um, you gotta put the object on that slit so the light goes through onto the diffraction grating and then spreads out onto the imaging CCD, which can be seen on the bottom there. Um, but this is a, the tracking CCD with a calibration lamp on there. Um, just during the calibration, we'll go over also in a moment, um, you need to be able to see how wide that slit is in pixels. Um, but here's kind of the, the tracking CCD in action. This big um, bright blob is Jupiter. That's a reflection of Jupiter. And that spot is Io. And you might be able to see the little tiny cut through it and probably knocks the resolution here is poor from the lighting, but um, 
that's right on the slit, ready to be um, spectra extracted, I guess you could say. Um, in the bottom here, it's uh, the corresponding um, imaging CCD from that um, lamp calibration. So um, the bottom left there, that's mercury. Those are um, very well-known uh, wavelengths, spectral lines that correspond to mercury. It's like a signature. That's how we identify what something's made out of spectroscopically, um, because elements have a signature. Um, signature wavelength distribution, essentially. And this bottom right one is just an example spectrum of IO. And again, I don't know if you can see it, but these <coughs> tiny little black lines going up and down kind of along the x-axis there, those correspond to emission lines. Um, and or They are emission lines, and they correspond to, to some kind of element that um, is blocking light of that wavelength. Um, and so calibrating the spectrograph. This is part of my goals. I um, was getting really familiar, and I did spend a ton of time in the lab, mostly like the first half of the semester, getting acquainted. Um, the, the general breakdown of how this works, um, you adjust the component, so here's an example of a, a focus acromat, which, you know, um, I believe it makes the slit uh, either wider or narrower. Um, you adjust it a little bit, shine a calibration lamp, and see the results. So here's a, a not calibrated um, tracking CCD slit. It's crooked, that means the camera's not centered, so it's just a little <coughs> example of all the many things that you have to fix when you're calibrating a machine. Um, and then the center here is kind of the setup in the lab. Very, uh, kind of improvised, just stacked it on physics books to line up with the, with the light there, which shines through there. The, the lens there will kind of mimic um, focused light from a telescope, so the lights will be off when I'm doing this also. Um, and the data acquisition, this was honestly one of my favorite parts of this whole thing, was being able to spend all this time outside um, looking at space. I would often find myself getting really distracted and not doing my work and just like, looking at stuff, which was totally <laughs> awesome, but um, and, you know, um, just a privilege to be able to go out there and, and use this equipment it was really, really awesome. Um, so I had the ladder there because, which I'll also go over in a second, but you have to take a calibration spectrum of that, for example, the mercury lamp right after an exposure, um, because you're going to use that to calibrate the spectrum later. Um, and this is the telescope pointed upward with the spectrograph on the back. Um, here's just an example of some raw data. Um, this is from a program called CCD Ops, which is where the spectrum gets placed after you take the exposure. Um, it looks kind of like just blurry stuff. It doesn't look like much yet because it's not reduced. Um, there's hot pixels in there. Um, the aperture where you want to extract the light from isn't defined yet. Um, but this is kind of um, the row pro profile. It kind of resembles what the extracted spectrum will look like once you reduce it. Um, so you can see these little spikes are emission and the drops are absorption. Um, and then this is the corresponding, this is the spectrum of IO, this is a corresponding calibration length which will be overlaid uh, and then you can extrapolate the wavelengths because we know exactly what wavelengths these are, like I said, because they're a characteristic of mercury elements. Um, so the data reduction was another big hurdle for me, um, getting acquainted with the command line um, because, I mean, in the vast scheme of doing this kind of stuff, it's the most efficient and effective and um, kind of uh, widespread way of getting the most variation out of what you can do. Um, so it's called PyRAF, which is a combination of the language Python with PyRAF, Image Reduction Analysis Facility, which uh, is software basically for doing data reduction on um, astronomical studies. Um, so just kind of a few frames. There's a lot more that I left out because um, it's a very multi-step process. But you'll basically, um, if you if this histogram here, you'll kind of imagine as that, that um, the raw spectrum, if you're looking at it onward like that, um, that's kind of the intensity peaks right there in the middle. That's where you want to extract from is the highest intensity. So you define that, you subtract the background noise. This is going to define your dispersion axis. Um, so basically the path that you want to take that spectrum from. Um, calibrating, um, you mark the wavelengths here on the calibration spectrum. They get overlaid, do a couple of little things, and voila, you have a wavelength calibrated spectrum. This one happens to be of Jupiter. Um, and I, just, I didn't label it, but this line over here is hydrogen alpha, which is a, a very um, prevalent, um, well, hydrogen's prevalent in the universe and uh, prevalent in a lot of objects too, so just one thing to identify. Um, so here's kind of culminating one of my goals um, is having a wavelength calibrated spectrum of IO. Um, and kind of one of the things that always interested me about IO is its volcanic activity. And two of the biggest volcanic, their signatures of volcanic activity is um, sodium and sulfur, um, which I marked here uh, where they're. Um, those absorption lines are. So these, this is the sodium doublet here. Um, the biggest intensity, or I should say least intensity, um, but the most prevalent feature here. Um, so that means there's a lot of sodium on IO, um, just like we would expect. Um, there are there have been previous studies on this, but it was cool to kind of replicate, you know, be able to find those things. Uh, and then sulfur as well. 
So that's the wavelength covered spectrum. You can see the x-axis here is wavelength. Angstroms is um, uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So it's very, very tiny wavelength. Um, and then kind of another uh, facet of this was um, the other objects part of my title. Um, was I studied Pollux, which is a star. It's an F2 uh, red giant. Um, and basically, when I extracted the spectra, I noticed that it was uh, kind of peaky. It's, uh, you can see it's kind of maximized the intensity in the middle there, which is very characteristic of what's called a black body, um, or a, uh, basically a spread of electromagnetic intensity over a constant temperature. Um, and you can model that with something called the Planck Law, um, which is basically intensity as a function of wavelength and temperature. So um, using that equation, which I derived from my uh, wonderful uh, astrophysics class, and, um, and I actually got to apply it here, I'll show you in the next slide. Um, but basically, um, if it's really a black body peak, then I should be able to um, fit it uh, with the um, known temperature. Um, so basically, I took kind of the average wavelength of that peak because it's not very evident where exactly it is. Um, and then applied another uh, concept called Dean's Law, um, which is derived from uh, Planck. Um, and so basically, if I was able to um, extract an accurate temperature, then a black body should fit pretty nicely over it. And I did manage to actually um, calculate that temperature with 0.3% accuracy. Uh, 0.3% error, excuse me. Um, so that came to the final thing here, which is the um, spectrum fit with a black body curve of the same temperature. And so kind of um, bringing together you know, my research with kind of my class experience. And um, really, this is kind of the, the nitty gritty of what I ended up doing. And it's a really cool result. So you can see this black body is represented in red there. Um, it actually lines up very, very nicely with the peak of that um, spectrum, too. So measured the temperature of a star and um, fit a black body curve to it. So um, in the future, uh, I would really like to monitor IO in the time domain. So um, trying to detect spectral redshifts, um, basically as it's orbiting Jupiter um, spectroscopically. So you can detect the tiny shifts in uh, toward the red of these wavelengths. Um, and then to also um, do what's called flat fielding, um, which is kind of correcting for the spatial variations of sensitivity of the <coughs> CCD, um, because it's not going to um, basically respond exactly the same to every wavelength of light. Um, so one way you can do that is take an incandescent light uh, of a known temperature and kind of use the same methodology of black body fit, um, and then you divide the, the theoretical black body um, by the extracted spectrum that you take of that lamp, and then you can use the result, which is called a flat field, on any other image that you use, uh, that you take on that CCD, um, and it's actually going to be a much more accurate, um, kind of better model of what you just extracted uh, spectroscopically. And I also just wanted to give another big thanks to Dr. Severson for always being there, kind of advising me, answering all my crazy questions, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so my, my whole thought on that um, was I, I knew those were there because of um, previous studies and I was comfortable saying that that's what these are. Um, I was going through and I, I picked out every wavelength and I'd see you know that they belong to certain things. There was a lot of calcium in there, but I wanted to make sure that basically for me to feel comfortable marking those wavelengths, I would want to do many, 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 many more extractions um, kind of again in the time domain and actually see if they're there, compare them to Jupiter maybe. And that's just something I never got to, so I didn't feel comfortable actually labeling them as this element or that element. Yeah. What was your signal to noise price? Signal to noise. Um, I didn't get the actual figure on that, which is something I should have done. Um, and I did take, um, all my exposures were uh, immediately dark um, corrected. Um, as they were done, so that got rid of a little bit of the noise, the, the hot pixels and stuff at least. Um, but as far as the actual ratio, I don't have that figure. Did you stack images or was it just one? This one was not stacked. Okay. Were you looking at the composition of the whole body or did you have um, the kind of resolution where you look at it and say okay, there was a, a high concentration of this and the whole and this and that? 
Yeah, so that's also one of the things that I kind of conceptualized at the beginning. Um, but it was just, it's so small, even the whole body in the frame that you're getting everything, even some byproduct of Jupiter, the stray light that's coming in. Um, but that would be really cool if we had some kind of, I guess, a higher magnification um, to be able to zone in. It, it, that'd be hard to do from ground level. There's already so much atmospheric interference just looking through all that. Um, 